Mark. Francis, there you are. How are you doing, man? I'm doing great. And, you know, I know I just said this a moment ago, but thank you so much for being on here, man. Oh, yeah, no worries. Yeah, I'm a huge fan, seriously, from from the nerd perspective. (laughs) Yeah, from, um, you know, obviously the animal training, you know, there's Uh tons of that going on. And there's a lot of stuff I want to talk about, but I want to preface the whole thing by my biggest admiration and adoration of your work and that is um the the video you know you you've got this youtube channel master of hounds and you've got uh-huh. what hundreds probably hundreds of videos on there probably i've sort of uh i've left it uh alone for a while so i don't really remember how many i have on there but yeah okay well there's some i mean everything is an absolute gem but there is there's one video <clears throat> that just where you've got these shoes and you're at the gas station, like you're pumping gas or something, and <laughs> yes, it's just the video is just of your shoes, and these shoes are like, I mean, they're are they clown shoes? Are they kind of clown shoes? Yeah, they, they they're actually this clown shoes that I found in a box right there, and I put them on, and and I made that video. <laughs> okay, so that that's that's ultimately the the what's the word brunt of my question where you're so creative man you're always doing such creative things that's what really gets me off and i'm wondering like where is it coming from is it just did you just see that and you're like i'm gonna make this funny video of or not even funny, maybe you think it was funny i mean where does it come from i mean is it just is it like that is it just coming I guess so i mean you gotta be kind of uh strong enough to be a little vulnerable and get your idea out there and kind of, you know, do something original. So yeah. it comes from, you know, hopefully some sort of strength to do that. Um, but also just comes from curiosity, you know, like just wonder what and, and a sense of uh, playfulness and just like, just to know what would happen if kind of thing. Mm-hmm. Is that... Well, is that where you take the same approach with your training too? Yeah, for sure. I mean, um, you know, with training, a lot of stuff, you know what's going to happen when you do things. And to try and find the thing, the new thing can be difficult. Um, And that's always a a really nice find, a new gem, a new technique, a new, um, a new, concept something to do that's new with a dog besides heel sit down stay come and all those things yeah you know? yeah so you know before we get to all the stuff you're doing now um when i first met you i met you i was trying to figure it out here a minute ago i think i met you it was in 2005 in september so that would be about 13 years ago Okay. And um, right away, I was like, oh, this guy's cool. And, and you gave me actually, you know, we talked a little bit and, and you talked to me about poodles, which I had growing up. Oh, yeah. But then I'm like, well, this guy knows what he's talking about. And he's and I, we had a real good dog growing up, but we also had one that wasn't very good. And I never really gave him too much thought. But I was like, well, I'm going to look more into this, you know. So okay. but you had a Boston Terrier with you <laughs> and we were talking about backflips and then. <laughs> You gave me a DVD uh, of you working, well, with uh, primarily, I think it was Gubby and Clutch. Uh-huh. Right? Yeah. It, it, old it, yeah. So I think what some people maybe who are act who, who've been turned on to you in the, in the recent years, they don't know you are heavy into protection. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Definitely. I mean, that's, to- that's where it came from. Yeah, so that's where I wanted to, how did you start? I mean, you're, you're, you're not from California, you're from Maine, is that right? That's correct, yeah. Okay, cool, I got it right. Yeah. Um, so how'd you start? I mean, how did it, and you're, wait, real quick, I got to say one more thing. You are another statistic for me because I feel that musicians are some of the best dog trainers because of timing uh-huh. and, uh-huh. Yes. and you're also a musician. Right, yeah, and yeah, we should talk about that because I think that's true too. Yeah. I, I really like uh you know, music, there's something, there's some connection between music and dog training with the timing and the sort of intuition and feel. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. Touch. Yeah. So wh- when and how did you get going with stuff? I mean, did you have a dog growing up or? You know, my, my first dog, it was like the fan, the, the, my parents' dog. 
and it was a basset hound named Maud, and it was like a disaster. I'm sure, you know, it was like textbook. Um, we did everything wrong. Uh, my parents didn't know any better. They got bad advice. Um, and uh, after that, um, I really wanted a dog, but they didn't want a dog, so I had to wait until I was uh, a little older as a teenager where I like got a pit bull. You know, I really wanted a pit bull, so I got one. And, um, you know, then I encountered, well, I, I developed an interest in behavior because I encountered all kinds of stuff uh, that was, you know, uh, interesting about the dog. You know, it wanted to get into fights and, um, you know, it wanted to do all kinds of stuff. And, and um, so it got me interested in training. Uh, and, and long before that, I had, uh, I had a neighbor that was training uh, a harbor seal named Andre that became sort of like this movie, uh, Andre the Seal. And I was, I like, you know, collected um, money from the tourists down in Rockport Harbor um, where the seal was. So I, I was watching this when I was a little kid. Oh, wow. And, and um, this guy and his family the Goodriches were, you know, had, they were my across the street neighbors and, and they had helped me with all kinds of stuff, iguanas, uh, you know, <laughs> turtles, like any, every, everything I got from the pet store that I was trying to keep alive in like a really cold, you know, old farmhouse sort of thing. Like they were helping me with, and I was watching him train the seal and I was, you know, I was sort of sinking in, I think. How, um, how, how old were you then? How old were you? Then I was like six, you know, oh, seven. Wow. Yeah. Okay. I didn't so, know that. I had no idea about that. Yeah. So there's a movie called um, A Seal Called Andre, which oh, actually, yeah. all, all the, they're all um, they're all sea lions in the movie. They're not harbor seals. And Andre was a harbor seal. He didn't do any like half the cool tricks that a uh, a sea lion can do. But, oh, okay. Uh, but he still, you know, he did cool stuff and um, really drew a crowd. And the, and Harry Goodrich was a lobsterman, you know, and he like really was like a salt of the earth guy. He figured out how to do all the tricks and stuff. And, and uh, anyway, so that kind of got me thinking. And then, you know, I got my dog and you know, I really loved my first dog. It was all mine. I had to, you know, uh, you know. I remember I had to write a letter to the landlord of our building, like, you know, dogs weren't allowed, but I like wrote a letter, like, you know, I'll, you know, totally keep this dog out of trouble and I won't, you know, just destroy the premises and stuff like that. Right. Yeah. So, um, but, uh, you know, as, as I grew up, I just developed more of an interest in, in dog training and, working dogs and, and eventually, um, you know, I was just sort of like a punk kid with a pit bull skateboarding around trying to train my dog. And I saw a ring sport trial and uh, yeah, what? it was like, it was before the internet. So it was like in the paper. Um, yeah, what, what year do you remember? Sorry. Do you remember what year? Like, um, like 95. And so, you know, I saw this, or maybe no, no, it was it was earlier than that. Um, yeah, it was um, Mike Speccicello, I think is his name, is the uh, um, early decoy in, in Nara, the Canis Doberman Club in in Chicago, was putting on this trial, and they had listed in the back of a you know a dog rag. Um, and so I saw it I, and I went to this trial with my pit bull and my skateboard and watched what was going on. And I, I was like, this is amazing. I can't believe these dogs can climb these things and jump and, and tackle the bad guy and all this stuff. So um, that got me interested and that got me uh, a Malinois. And I got a Malinois from there, from Cheryl Carlson. And wow. Yeah. And so I got my first uh, Malinois from Cheryl Carlson, and she put me in the suit. I remember uh, getting in the, in, uh, you know, in the Jean-Michel Moreau costume, 
and you know out on the ice in her driveway in Michigan and getting blown over by a bunch of big dogs and and sort of got into to ring sport from that I got that puppy I drove home you know with that puppy and uh, I moved to LA and I was training it along the way and um, by that time I was already a professional dog trainer and I was training dogs for people in their houses and stuff and I met this guy named Jean-Jacques Girardo, who was at uh, one time a training director for a, a, a club in France, in the south of France, and um, he was a retired baker at the time, and he was uh, living in L.A., and uh, I bugged him, and he said, no, 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 kid, go away, I don't want to train anymore, and I said, come on, Jean-Jacques, train me, and he did, and then... Um, you know, from there I started winning competitions with my dog, you know, and, and he taught me a lot of stuff and then I just took it from there and became a decoy and French ring and Mondio ring and titled up to ring three and all that kind of stuff. All the while I was training dogs for the public, um, you know, doing pet dog stuff. Okay. So that's sort of it in a nutshell brings wow. us up to, um, you know, I don't know that, that, that's not it in a nutshell. It's been a long time, I guess. So <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I could keep going, but um, I think but that brings you like up the ring sport thing. And eventually, I got burnt out on it. Um, and I, I, I really, um, I took a lot of stuff that I love for ring sport and combined it with uh, a lot of uh, amazing tricks that I that I had learned over the years that uh tricks that i thought that any dog could do and i and i made that into uh canine circus school so we don't just specialize in tricks that like a certain athletic dog can do or a certain dog that's easy to train but any dog could do it be it a you know a northern breed or a hound dog or, or what have you we we can train them to do it using these methods yeah uh because you have you know, I've seen you had you have a do you do you still have your Malamois now? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so you have a Malamois, and you have that. You know, I keep hearing all this stuff secondhand, but you have that yeah. little dog, Schwartz. Yeah. Uh, Schwartz, yeah. And how did you how did you get him? Was there some story behind it? Yeah, well, I was just driving to my friend's house, and uh, he ran in front of my truck, and I stopped and. Um, you know, I started slowing down. I thought, oh, I don't need to do this again. You know, I've, I've rescued enough dogs. and uh, But I, I, I couldn't let it go, so I circled back and uh, pulled up. And uh, I got him to come up to me, and he jumped in the car, and I tried to find a, uh, an owner for him. And no one claimed him, so I, I just kept him myself. He was a good little dog. You've got him to do some pretty crazy stuff. But, oh yeah, he's so capable, and you know how it is as uh, when you're a professional dog trainer. It's hard to train your own dog sometimes once you get a full schedule. Yeah, and man, that dog is really capable. What I've trained him to do is only you know a fraction of what he could do if I trained him more often. Really? Yeah. Well, I know the stuff you had your bulldogs doing. <clears throat> well, your bulldogs, you know, in that video that you gave me, so. Actually, where you brought us up to is even, I think, before I met you. Probably. <laughs> yeah. I so, guess so. Yeah. Yeah. When I met you, <clears throat> you told me something. You told me, well, you told me two things that never left me and always stuck and actually really not only changed the way I looked at things, but it gave me ammunition, actually, in mm -hmm. conversation, which was <clears throat> the first thing was about the poodle and how they were so capable and they're incredible and, you know, all this kind of stuff. They're working dogs type thing. Mm -hmm. And that sparked and kind of sprouted the idea for me. But the, the, the biggest thing was what you said about bulldogs mm. in our conversation. And you said, <clears throat> you said, people got it all wrong. They think they need a tough dog. You need mm -hmm. a sensitive dog. Oh yeah, with a bulldog for sure. With yes. a bulldog, right? And I was in this, I th you know, I was in this presso world at the time, and uh -huh. all I could hear was hard dog, hard dog, yeah. hard dog. And I'm like, mm -hmm. you guys don't know how to train. 
because yeah. having a dog that's so difficult just to work with to because sometimes things involve some force you know they don't feel like yeah. running, you got to make them do it whatever as gentle as it may be and you know the harder the dog or quote unquote harder which to me is just a stupid word but anyway so i use that as ammunition and, yeah. and, the, and the thing that could back up that ammunition is what you did with those two were those american bulldogs yeah yeah and those tugs you titled in my, my both did you title both of them? Well, no. Um, so one of them was mine, uh, Gubby. Gubby. And so I, I I titled him in Mondio and and French Ring. Yeah. Uh, the one level, even though I had done all the exercises, um, eventually he had Lyme disease, and it was or he was like kind of getting like looking like he was about to pass out when he was doing trials and stuff, and yeah. so I decided to retire him but um so gubby was the one that i really worked on so then gubby's father uh was titled by another guy neil um so that was like you know he was sort of the first two two ring sport american bulldogs bred together made gubby and that kind of made him special and then from there uh gubby had a son named clutch which you've probably seen videos of which uh wasn't my dog but um you know, I, I helped with the training quite a bit and, um, that dog was like even more, um, seemed more capable of ring sport than his father, you know, in just terms of like the, the things that people look for in ring sport, the speed and precision and the sort of sensitivity to, to listen and stuff like that. So, so that's, those are the two dogs or maybe the three dogs you're thinking about. Yeah, but and yeah. then you had a you had a Chomsky. Yeah, yeah then I, well, that's right. I have to get Chomsky too, which is a granddaughter um, of Gubby, and she. Um, I didn't, you know, I didn't really start in ring sport. I, I I did. I have a couple videos where where I tried out a little bit with her, but um, you know, it's a lot of work. Any anything that you're doing with an off breed. Oh. Sport is a lot of work, and um, at that point, I was like, I don't need all this work. <laughs> yeah. So um, I didn't do it with her. Um, I think she would have been, you know, even more sensitive, probably too sensitive. Um, you know, so of course, there need to have checks and balances. Uh, your <laughs> bit ability, the sensitivity levels. Yeah. Yeah. But you got her to still do. I mean, I saw there's videos of her all over YouTube doing <clears throat> crazy things, putting putting letters in the mailbox, I think, was one of them. Yeah. Did you have her do that? Of, you know, I taught her to do all kinds of tricks, you know, and, you know, that's one thing I really pride myself on is uh, being able to train all types of dogs to do tricks and um, not just you know the the honor students like border collies i mean they are really great dogs to train and and people do amazing things with with them um but i'm always looking for something that since i'm a professional dog trainer you know i make i make money by training people to train their dogs i'm looking for things that um i could train people to do you know um that if, if they come in with a blue tick hound um, we can get this dog to, to do just like, you know, a German Shepherd could do it mm -hmm. and ways to do that. So I'm always looking for little new angles and new techniques and, and, um, stuff like that. How often do you find yourself just, uh, you know, improvising or just trying something? Uh, so I've got it. Well, I can't in circus school. I've got these four levels okay. and my, my, my fourth level, which is the highest level, um, I improvise and, and use them to test ideas. Um, I, I've always tested them first to, to a certain degree, but I haven't done a lot of testing with them. But all my other classes, um, you know, everything, people like the classes because they move really fast. Um, so everything's paced um, where there's no downtime whatsoever. Everyone's doing something every five minutes is scheduled out. Um, to what they're going to be learning. Um, so there, there's a certain rigidity there. Um, with my own dogs and my own sort of ex exploration of, of training, I try and do all kinds of weird stuff mm. you know, that where, I, where I improvise. 
And um, I also do sections in our group classes that are freestyle sections where they can take within a structure um, and improvise over it, adding things. Cool. Um, yeah, so for instance, if we're doing uh, hoops, they're jumping through hoops, they might have a different way to present the hoop to the dog. Maybe they present it, you know, on the flat or, or um, you know, over their arm or under their arm or over their leg or something like some variation. Yeah. Uh, and see, and we see what comes out of it. That's cool. Cause you're, <clears throat> you're encouraging people to improvise, which yeah, is, a, yeah. you know, you got to give them material to do it with. Otherwise they just draw a blank. Sure. You know, a, a, in an early on in, you know, circus school has been going for seven years now and early on, um, I had more sort of um, theatrical improv elements trying to, to weave in uh, storytelling and, and patter and whatnot like that. Um, and it was really hard for, it was, it was probably too challenging for people to train and do that. Mm -hmm. At the same time, they need to, um, they need to uh, progress a little bit more before they can start thinking about their shtick. Yeah other things that that are yeah. involved with the actual yeah yeah so now we just practice like we have certain moves where we practice not looking at the dog and looking up at the audience mm. uh to train the dog that they have to still uh be engaged with us if we're not engaged with them you know that's sure just that like like you could say like ring or ipo right isn't that kind of the deal you're supposed to be like in ipo you're like kind of you know, seemingly not connected to the dog, at least nowadays. Yeah, yeah. it's yeah. the same thing. Yeah, it's I mean, the concepts in dog training, I mean, the thing is that it's, it's all the same. It's how they do different things with the same. <laughs> the same, I mean, there's different ways to train dogs for sure. Um, but um, there's different, um, there, there's processes that we know cause change in behavior. Yeah. So and we know that, you know, these processes work. Right. We just need to figure out how to get this new behavior through these processes to come out the way that we want, you know, uh, classical conditioning and operant conditioning and all that kind of stuff. Um, you know, then how do we come out with our finished product of our behavior? Um, it's the same stuff. It's just applied. The creativity is applying in different ways. You know, that, the limitations that makes your create it is that's what kind of gives you. Creativity is your limitations. What do you do with your limitations? Yeah, yeah. That's exactly. why, I like, you know, if someone is such a, such a good musician mm -hmm. that they could do anything. A lot of times, it gets very bland and boring because there's no struggle in there for them. You know, you're not living the struggle with them, mm -hmm. and they're just like too virtuosic, and you know, it just it's um, you know, they're not holding back. Well, if, if they're good enough to edit themselves, that's another level, you know. What I mean? <laughs> sure, sure. But um, yeah, but you, you so you're saying you ah, I, there's so many things I'm trying to ask at the same time. You you I know you did stuff back with Bart Balone years and years and years ago. So you're familiar with all that stuff, oh, yeah. his approach. Well, I, and, um, I just went to a seminar and, you know, hung out with him for a, a weekend. And and of course, I was really um blown away by his videos when I first saw him. Yeah. You know, um, now it, nowadays it looks like, you know, good ring sport with a couple tricks thrown in, yep. you know, yep. and good e-collar training stuff, you know. Um, but um, at the time I was really, you know, enthralled by the energy of his work. Mm -hmm. And <laughs> him just as, a, a, you know, a, you know, I remember he was like doing, you know, f flips or something over dogs when he, in a suit, you know, Belgian dogs coming in. He was doing like forward flips over them. I saw some video. I mean, he was just like a, a piece of work and, you know, and uh, just a really interesting guy. Well, his, his techniques are, are complicated, though, right? I mean, no, it's not. I mean, they're overly complicated from my point of view, um, you know. And from, 
you know, the whole nay popo thing. Yeah. Um, I don't really need the nay first. Um, I don't, but also I don't, I don't focus on electric collars. Mm -hmm. So maybe if we want to do everything with electric collars, that would really help a lot to have the, the nay before the two positives. Mm -hmm. Um, but, um, you know, so there's a bunch of gadgetry in there, which, um, is, I guess some, some people are very attracted to that. Um, I think if you, if you, if, you know, it's good to learn e-collars from people that are really involved in that, um, if that's what you want to do. Um, but, uh, to me, um, it's, I'm trying to find ways to simplify things for people. Um, and, and that's the real challenge and find ways to, to, uh, run the classes where, um, there's sort of interwoven levels of complexity because they've learned this. Now they can do this and that links in, links in with this. Um, and, um, and, and I try to keep it really simple and I try not to talk about too much theory. Mm -hmm. Um, and we, 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 um, practice by doing and until we come to sort of teachable moments and I try to, you know, drop some knowledge when they're, when they're, when they're already asking the question. Mm -hmm. Suzuki. <laughs> it's Suzuki. Yeah. You know Suzuki? That Suzuki yeah. method? Yeah. I, well, so there is, you know, I, I, I've read about it because, um, I've been playing uh, fiddle and yeah. so, um, and, uh, th there's interesting things about it that, you know, um, that leave me with, you know, scratching my head, uh, on like, like the playing slow stuff. Um, and you know, I agree to, we're going over to music now, but, um, I agree that, you know, playing slow is a great way to learn how to play it faster and stuff, but sometimes you just need to shred, you know, <laughs> you know and you, sometimes you just, it doesn't matter if it's, if it's clean, something else might come out of it. You know, mm -hmm. so yeah, Suzuki, but not so rigid. I mean, mm -hmm. I think you could just, I think there's, um, just trying to play something fast makes, gives, you know, just challenges your nerves, um, and, and helps you speed it up just mm -hmm. like playing something slow. And also there's a memory thing with playing fast, slow, it's slower. It's harder to see the big picture, harder to memorize faster. No one ever said, oh, let me remember that, and then played it really down-tempo, slowly to remember it. You know what I mean? They play it fast. Uh, I think it goes like this. Mm -hmm. And, you know, so there's a memory component to the, the speed work, and then there's, you know, sort of a physical component to the slow work. Mm -hmm. And that's what my kind what kind of um, similarities are you finding now with, because, so you play a bunch of different instruments, though. I try. You know? Yeah, you play uke really well. I've heard you play uke, and, and you play yeah, uke, yeah, very yeah. proficient there. Uh, I, I, you know, I kind of, I was really into bass. You can probably see that there. Oh, upright bass. Yeah, well, then also electric bass and everything like that. Um, and then I saw uke on the wall. And I, and I said, this is pretty cool. I saw it. So I started learning how to play that. And my, my father's a fiddler. Mm -hmm. So and a banjo player and all kinds of stuff. So, um, you know, me and him kind of, we were kind of on the outs for a while, kind of had disagreements about some things and, and, uh, you know, I figured everyone was getting older. It's time to, um, you know, let, let water go under the bridge. And uh, so I thought, well, you know, a cool constructive thing to do when we hung out is is play fiddle tunes together. So I started learning the fiddle uh, about four years ago, and I really, you know, studied hard. And it was good because I started taking classes, and that put me in a learning mode, mm -hmm. um, which helped my classes a lot. Mm -hmm. So I, you know, I got really like, you know, in that feedback loop. And so yeah, now I've been playing fiddle a bunch, um, and and um, so that's been great. That's been really great for ear training 
because you can't really see anything, you know, it's like kind of foreshortened down here. So you just, and it's blaring in your ear and it's just not as visual as the guitar or anything like that, mm -hmm. you know? So, and you know, I play a little banjo and dobro and all, you know, the string instruments, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. um, you know, mandolin. Um, so I'm really into that kind of stuff. Wow. Yeah. Uh, yeah fiddle's tricky though, because there's no frets. Your intonation has to be just spot on, and there's not a lot of room in there. In yeah, that. but you know what? It's like this genius invention because it's just built on your the structure of your hand. Really? Your hand, yeah. Your hand just kind of falls into the scale structure, you know? Um, yeah, yeah, I guess I don't see a lot of movement when I see guys playing. It all seems really economic, you know? Yeah, like well, the yeah. hand is really tight. and Yeah, because it's, in, you know, in fifths, you know, it's, it's, um, it's linear. So everything scales the same exact way. Oh, it's you know, fifths. So there's no, you know, another pattern halfway up the neck, like uh, with a guitar or something like that, with a reentrant tuning. Um, yeah. but you know, it's, um, mostly if, when you're playing folk fiddle, you're playing in the first position and your hand just sort of, uh, will naturally fall into the major scales of like, you know, three or four keys, the sharp keys, you know, just naturally, you know, I mean, you got to get it there, begin, but once you, once you stop fighting it, you'll see how it's like this genius invention where just kind of the way all your tendons pull together, if you hold your hand the right way, everything just falls right on the notes. What about the right hand? What about the right hand? I mean, that's oh, right hand, it's that's another world. Hard. Yeah, that's the hard part. You know, um, the bowing hand, I, you know, with, with the old time music, it's, it's the, one of the most important things. Is is how the the, the the Boeing hand plays the rhythm and stuff and and um, you know that just takes years of development. You know, it's like so, you know, it's it's like you might know how to play an instrument, but you can't really make a good tone. Yeah, <laughs> you know, like to, like bringing out the tone of something, or you can't like get all those ghost notes in that make something funky, or mm -hmm. you know, it's it's like that. So that just that just takes endless hours of screwing up till you get it right. So, but it's, it's a great, it's been a great journey and um, it's really nice. Unlike in like rock music to have like a traditional, uh, a traditional music that, that you're learning within a tradition. And um, it frees you from a lot of other things that you have to learn or do or, you know, image or, you know, that sort of thing. It's also, at least for me, it's beautiful. It's beautiful. It's exciting. It's challenging. It's not, you know, I, I'm, I'm a bit of a musical uh, snob, you know. Uh -huh. I really am. I don't like, I don't Dude. like simple music. I don't. And the thing is, like, right now I'm learning this John Dowland tune. Mm. Right. I don't know that. He's, um, he was like the first pop star of England. He was, he was trying to get a gig at King Henry's. King Henry's court, King Henry the eighth. Oh, wow. Yeah. But he was cool. stuck in between two worlds because he was a Catholic and everybody was switching over to, uh, uh Protestantism and yeah. So this guy played a lute and sang these tunes. Oh, nice. And it's like, I, I can't begin to, there's so much counterpoint going on between <laughs> not only the guitar, but the voice and the guitar. Oh, Wow. Super. I've been working on this thing for like six months, probably, and it's just fine. But I'm like, wow. this this was pop music 500 years ago. Yeah. <laughs> What's going on, man? I mean, yeah. you know, just the way the music has just, you know. But everything well, you're talking different tracks with the counterpoint, and now they just do it on, you know, GarageBand or whatever. Yeah, but I don't even know if people know what counterpoint is anymore. <laughs> you know what I mean? <laughs> yeah. Well, it's you know, it exists in. <laughs> music and and it does exist in music they just don't know that it's there yeah. necessarily you know they're just they're blinded by other technologies and other glimmering things and not you know knowing the magic behind music mm -hmm. i love that guy um 
Rick Beato. You know what I'm talking about? This YouTube guy. Uh, I haven't seen him. Let me write it down. I mean, if you want to go down like a nerdy music theory route, check this guy out. He is like um, superhuman on the theory stuff. How do you how do you spell his last name? Like um, Beto. 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 Yeah. I got it. Beato. Got it. Yeah, I mean, this guy is uh, really explains um, really advanced theory stuff. It's cool. Um, definitely an inspiring cat. Thank you for that, because that's yeah, yeah. Because I was a drummer, you know. For, uh, right, uh, I, I know that. Yeah, and then you switched to guitar. Yeah. Yeah. So, uh, tell me about your drumming and your your musical life. <laughs> I know you're interviewing me, but I've taken over. Okay. Uh, uh, all right. I started playing started playing piano when I was four. We all had to. And okay. My parents both play, and they were they were both professional musicians when we were born. And my dad my dad owned a music store, so. Oh. oh. Yeah. So I, we were. I used to say even before I knew dogs and stuff, I used to say we were uh -huh. bred. You know, because my dad uh -huh. had this like, probably partridge family idea thing going yeah. on. You know. Yeah. So uh, I started playing piano when I was four, and I always liked music, but uh, tried playing guitar when I was eight or nine, and he had me uh -huh. going through the book, super boring. Uh -huh. And uh, at one point, I was watching a concert on MTV or something of the band Europe. You remember Europe? Uh-huh. Yeah, it was you know the, the final countdown or whatever. I, well, I... I... I, I picture myself remembering Europe, but I don't know if I truly do, but I, I see hair. <laughs> You're on the right track, for and sure. Like shoulder pads. Yes, yes, yeah. Cur curls yeah. and yeah, yeah. So, um, but I looked at the drummer and he was behind this drum set and I was like, oh, I like this because I'm a little bit shy, right? So I was like, I like huh. this. So I just started noodling around when I was 11 and then um, got a kit when I was 12 and started playing with my dad when I was 13, and I was playing old country. And, oh, wow. But then playing with my buddies, playing like, uh, you know, heavy metal and stuff like that. Huh. I was pretty into Iron Maiden, you know? Uh -huh. And uh, and then I got into jazz and funk and um, just kept playing. And then out of high school, I, I you know, I, the deal with me was I, was I was playing four hours a day every day. And mm -hmm. I was basically either playing along with it. I would work a little bit of the stuff I was supposed to, very little mm -hmm. though. And then I would play with albums or uh -huh. I would just do stuff, you know. Uh -huh. And um, then <clears throat> got out of high school and got to playing professionally and got a gig with a band on the road and all that stuff. And that was when I got into dogs. And um, I just got, I got bored with the lifestyle. It was killing me. Yeah. I, I wanted, oh, sorry, what'd you say? overdid it yeah you did you did too much of one thing yeah it was all i was doing i was just completely i was just you know freaking out over and i and i i the drummers that i really dug were like you know i like vinnie Kaliuda. i don't know if you know that guy he's a oh. i'm binging on him right now recently actually yeah, yeah he's a yeah. freak he's a he's a you should check him out man he does things that you can't they call him the alien because he's he's does he was with Frank Zappa. Okay. He was with Frank Zappa when he was real young. So uh -huh. um, anyway, then <clears throat> at one point I uh, started noodling around on guitar again because through that whole time I could play a couple chords and I could kind of uh -huh. jam, you know, a little bit. Right. And uh, started playing. Drummers always think the best guitar players I've always found because the the rhythm stuff is so so you know, come so naturally, all the little like rhythmic intricacies you could do without even making a, a tone. Yes. You know, as a drummer, as long as you can get it going like this instead of, you know, like this. That's, that's, it, that's exactly it. You know, I never really thought about that, but that's something that was never hard for me. Uh -huh, it, yeah. and, then, and then I got into this dad gad tuning in this dude named oh, yeah. Pierre Ben Suzanne. I don't know if you heard of that okay. guy. Uh-huh. He plays at Freight and Salvage every year. Oh, okay. Yeah. I take lessons over there. Okay. So you, you yeah. just get, this guy is a, he's a French dude. He's a super freak. Okay. Super cool. freak. Super freak. Uh -huh. And he's in this dad gad all the time. So I did that for a while. And then um, a year ago, I hit up a classical guy because uh -huh. I really wanted good, I wanted better tone. 
-hmm. and I, I used to put a bunch of crap under my nails, like ping pong balls and acrylic nails and stuff like that. Oh, wow. Uh -huh. And I was tired of that, so I wanted to have natural nails, so I switched to nylon string. Uh -huh. it, and I'd been playing music now at this point. I'm 41, so I was 40. Mm -hmm. So I'd been playing music for 36 years. And uh -huh. this guy said, I'll give you lessons, but you have to start at the entry level. No way. Yeah, dude. Yeah. Yep. So I was like, okay. And I could read. I couldn't read all that great because I kind of forgot, but I could read. Uh -huh. But but then once I got into reading, I was yeah. like, my whole world opened up. And now it's like, all I can do is read. All I want to do is read. I love the fact that I can take something that somebody 500 years ago from who, Russia wrote uh -huh. down, and I can get the gist of what he was trying to say, you know. Uh -huh. It, it was pretty. So anyway, I'm in the now. I'm in the. Uh, I just finishing up the fourth book. So that's the fifth book technically. So I've been burning through wow. it, and I'm just trying to. And it's it's really got me. I mean, it's probably aside from horsing around with the dog I have now, like trying to do things that you're talking about, but lacking in creativity. <laughs> you know, yeah. you know. Yeah. Uh, it's pretty much one of my favorite things to do is just learn and try and get better and better and better and. Uh -huh. It's yeah, and you know what I like about this too is probably like you're learning, learning these fiddle tunes. They're generally not too long, uh -huh. you know. And it's it's almost like a game because it's like each one you conquer. It's exactly. Like, Got it. Yeah. Give me the next one, and it's like yeah. it's, it's almost a rush kind of to like look at a yeah. new one and think. You yeah, know, it's like, uh, yeah, it's like a puzzle, and and it, it is like that with the fiddle tunes. I mean, you have um, you know the A A B B structure. For just about every one of them, yeah. you know, that you're going to have A, A, B, you know, for the first part twice, the second part twice, and and you know, then from there you have your 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 phrases and your melodies, and I mean, your your phrases are you know, kind of have the same call and response, mm -hmm. then another call with a variation and a response with a variation. Mm -hmm. So it's just. Mm -hmm you know, riffs, basically, like heavy metal riffs, you just have to learn, you know, the call and response and put in that structure and that, that style and those rhythms and stuff like that. And uh, yeah, so um, it's like a language that builds up on itself. Mm -hmm. I learn it all by ear, you know. Um, the, you do. The, yeah. Which is a much it's, faster way to learn, I think. I think it. I think you learn the, the tune faster, it, you internalize it faster. I think so. Go a little slower maybe at first because you're like, what, what, huh? And then, you know, later you remember it and you don't have to refer back to the music. Exactly. So, um, but yeah, but I use the amazing slow downer on my phone. I don't know if you've seen that. No. Um, yeah, so it's it's great. But go ahead and buy like, you know, I don't know what it is, like 10 bucks or something like that, which I know it's expensive for an app, but this I find is worth it. Um even though other, there's other ones for cheaper or whatever, people recommend this one and I use it and I find it's great. The amazing slowdowner, you record um, whatever, you're, whatever you're trying to learn and then it keeps it in key and slows it down, you know. Or keeps you it in key. Yeah, and it slows it down with a high quality, in a high quality way, you know. And then you can save, you know, and label all the tracks and you can, uh, you know, uh, just take a sample of it and just, you know, loop the one hard passage over and over and over again. Amazing slow downer. Yeah. Amazing slow downer. Never On heard of it. Phone, you know, you, you videotape, even if it's just like, you know, the album or, or whatever, you know, you just like, you know, videotape it with your phone to get the audio, go into the amazing slow downer, go to your videos extract the audio it slows it you know slows it down to whatever i mean as slow as you want basically and you can speed it up of course too keeps wow. it in key yeah so i use that and you know i uh, or a person in my classes the teacher plays a phrase and all the students copy the phrase and it goes like that you know mm -hmm. um until we learn the whole thing um, and then I make a recording of it and I put it in the slow downer and I learn it from there. Wow. Yeah. How often, how often do you go to class? Well, either once or twice a week, depending on which classes I've signed up for. 
Oh, yeah, that's so mostly cool. Mostly there's just one that I go to once a week. So, yeah, great. so you know, uh, fiddle is super. I hate to go back to dog training, but it's for you know yeah. we're gonna we <laughs> gotta <laughs> no we gotta have another one of these where we can just forget about you know all the dog training yeah. people for a second. No yeah. offense, everybody, but um, fiddle involves crazy touch, right? Yeah, especially with the right hand. And yeah. Have you see, Have you noticed that anything since you started playing that, which you said is four years now? So you're you're in it. I mean, you're you know you're really five years after five years. They say you're in. You know, it's a long get. It's a it's a big, you know, thing with the fiddle. Yeah. So try and get in and get your intonation and get it to start coming naturally and stuff like that. So I'm just on the cusp. But yeah, you know, in terms of the, has it fed back to dog training? Yeah. Um, it definitely has. Um, you know, uh, so, I mean, just a couple things off the bat is a couple things I'm doing in, um, in circus school, uh, the way I'm, I'm describing um, how to hold your hand when you're feeding the dog to get different effects um, is coming from a bowing technique, you know, coming it's from like, you know, the sense of, you know, going back and yeah, like, you know, so, um, you know, so, so that, that's one. And that's, 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 that's something that's been real helpful, um, in, um, in getting, um, the bow, the, the play bow position, mm. you know, have to do with the biomechanics of the dog. The dog already knows how to do it. Uh, it's a natural behavior. They do it, you know, once, twice, three times a day on their own, the play bow to elicit play or stretch or whatever from other dog, you know, jump around with other dogs, run back and forth, doing the whole play bow thing. Um, but putting it on cue or, you know, drawing it out of the dog so then we could get it on cue um, is uh, it can be hard with some dogs. So that's one of our basic things that we do. And, and, um, you know, has a lot to do with the, the position in the back of the neck and what, when, uh, in terms of which um, set of joints the, the dog folds, you know, do they, do they, if, if their neck goes down, they walk backwards. If the neck goes up like this and it um, goes down in the back, they have a tendency to go in that play bow. So holding the, the, the food in certain ways will get the neck in different positions. And um, so we do a lot of biomechanics with that and sort of learning the biomechanics of bowing, I think, has helped with that. The, another interesting thing, though, that you said earlier that was a couple things you said earlier I wanted to touch on. But one was that um, that I wanted to comment was that you were, we were talking about, you know, it's having this uh, foundation of whatever you want to call it, interaction, ways of, you know, getting a dog to do the things that we're comfortable with. But you're getting them to do all this crazy stuff. And I've uh -huh. never seen, I, I personally haven't seen any kind of techniques for any of this anywhere. Are a lot of uh -huh. these things, are you just figuring out? I mean, over the uh, years? Yeah. You know, I've definitely been inspired by people that who I've seen work. Um, Omar Mueller, for instance. Um, you know, I worked with him in L.A. or alongside him, watching him. Um and, um, you know, I saw him work his dogs and was very inspired by that. And so, um, you know, we incorporate a lot of the tricks that he taught me into circus school. And so, uh, but most of it is this stuff that, you know, I, I've been thinking about for a long time. I've been collecting different ways to get the job done, um, the same behavior done in different ways. And um, uh, I developed a foundation of, of exercises that kind of are in between the cracks of what everyone else offers in the sort of dog training ecosystem, mm -hmm. but really important, you know, it's the sort of faces and the basis stuff, you know, it's like, yeah, they, they, they might have. You know, it's like the forest for the trees stuff. It's like they might have gotten a few exercises, but they missed the point in the bigger picture. You know, so we're giving them this bigger picture. Um, you know, so anyway, I think I, I think I, I think I got too far from my point. But <laughs> no, you're good. You're good. <laughs> yeah. So yeah, we're you know we're definitely a big we're a big picture uh, a big picture. Um, sort of place. I mean, 
uh, we don't worry so much about um, little, you know, so the, the, the small stuff. You know, we don't sweat the small stuff. We try and get the dogs having a good time, the people having a good time, and we try and keep this this balance of repetitions to variations. So the repetitions allow the dogs to get better, and the variations uh, keep everyone interested. Mm. You know, it's like music. You mm. know, so um, yeah, all this stuff. You know, basically, I try it. I, I try it on my dogs. I've tried it in dog with dogs in the past, and um, you know. I, I've I figured out just um, with trial and error how to explain it to people, different types of people and different types of dogs, and that's where all the techniques are coming from. That was my next question, though. Um, teaching a dog, you know, because you have touch and you have feel and you play music. So the thing I think about music is that music you develop timing, you know. Mm -hmm. yeah. and if you're playing with other people, you develop this. You develop this kind of internal and external timing, uh -huh. but. But then you also communicate in music without speaking. Uh huh. You know, yeah. and I think, and and that's obviously what's going on with the dogs. So, but at the same time, now you're you're training people, which is uh -huh. a completely different bag than right. training dogs. So you have to teach people how to touch and how to feel and how to, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. How ch how challenging is that? It's challenging. We have exercises that are specifically geared to developing touch and feel with our trainers that we start them on early. Um, um, stuff we, we do um, basically, you know, we we start describing how when you distribute the weight of the dog in various ways, it'll create different behaviors. So the sit pretty exercise they're learning to distribute the weight back on the dog okay so um when you when if you're trying to get one paw up you distribute the weight off you know onto the three paws that are on the ground you know and vice versa with the other paw right so um weight distribution is one method you know um another uh method is like this sort of sense of brinksmanship can they um can they push it to uh, push it to the limit a little bit. Can you get like, can you send the dog a little bit farther to the platform around the cone, um, to their place box? Um, and they develop a sense of feel there. Cause, um, like, uh, uh, for instance, we'll do an exercise where we're building distance to a target. Um, the target is going around the cone. And um, that's one of our general foundation exercises going like, you know, 10 feet and circling the cone and coming back. Um, uh, and we're working on, you know, fading the help from the handler, kind of bringing them, walking the dog to the cone um, and back to the platform to getting the dog to go on their own. Um, and so we'll, we'll, we'll get the, the, trainer to establish what full help is and then we'll give them some roadmaps to sort of understand what the dog looks like when they have when they're uh the the help has been lessened but not so much where they don't understand anymore mm -hmm. and should have them try it with no help so they can see sort of what they need to fill in and and coach them on how to fade you know how to do that gradual fade off of the other cues mm -hmm. um so that's a feel thing. Um, you know, other, other feel things uh, in, involve going from, we always structure our classes by going from sort of like big, mo big motions, like uh, big easy things, like going on top of something, um, coming to you, to smaller things like coming into the heel position, to even smaller things like positions, like, you know, sitting or sit pretty or that sort of thing, to even smaller, more finite motions. So, we, we develop, you know, a sense of moving the dog, you know, from, you know, really moving the dog um, from place to place than just moving smaller and smaller parts of the dog, <laughs> if you know what I mean. Wow. wow. But, so those are all field things that they learn right away in the first six classes. And you have four levels. Yeah. Wow. And you've been doing this for seven years. Yeah, we're on our seventh year now. But you've been doing this stuff. There were ten years ago. There was videos of you in the park with with Chomsky doing yes. all kinds of stuff. 
Right. So I started doing this with my ring sport dogs. Every dog that I came in contact with, I tried to train it to do some sort of tricks. And then I realized that the tricks were um, a way to get at some sort of deep seated behaviors that need to be fixed before, um, you know, the dog can really either truly trust the trainer or um, reach their full potential. Um, you know, so it was a way to develop potential in the dogs. And um, from, from there, you know, I learned all these tricks, um, you know, your basic tricks, and then we develop routines from the, from, the, from the tricks. And then those routines grew into other routines, grew into other, you know, subsets of routines and, and tricks. And now we have just a lot, a lot of material that we, we, we put our students through. We kind of we run it a little bit like a martial arts class. There's drills, mm. and they have to do the drills with their dogs. And it goes so fast, the dogs don't even have time to you know, think about misbehaving or getting in fights with each other. There, there's no idle time for them. Mm-hmm. Wow. But so... I'm just as you're talking about this. I'm just thinking: is your is your YouTube channel is, is the stuff that was on YouTube is that available on Facebook and stuff? You didn't um, you didn't because you have so many videos there. If people aren't going there, I there's some, like, so there's less videos now because I made a bunch of the bite work stuff private. What? But what about the like? So there's a lot less, but they're they're on there. Yeah, you'll see them. Like the wig lift. Yes. Yeah. That, that's yes. on there. That's on okay. there. You know, and, and before I forget, um, the video that you mentioned when we started about, you know, with the shoes at the gas station and stuff like that, you know, really thank you for, um, you know, I've never had any feedback on that video. Oh, it and, was your greatest and, piece. No, uh, and I just, I, you know, I think, um, you know, thank you for your encouragement on that one. Cause that was sort of, you know, had gone in a different direction than, um, you know, just pure dog training stuff. That was more of, you know, performative sort of thing <laughs> with found with found objects. Well, I had, I, I mean, for still to this day, I have friends over and if they don't know you, I'm like, you guys got to check this out. And that's always, I'll show them something first, like the wig lift or, uh-huh. uh, I mean, there's just, there's so many. The thing is, they're great. Those videos are, I, I know uh, it's just, that's your creative you being creative and thinking, huh, whatever you're thinking. I don't know what you're thinking, but that sh- stuff is so interesting. It's not just the dogs doing the trick. It's the environment. It's what's involved uh-huh. in the trick. It's this. Yeah. It's like there's so many funny, funny things going on. And it's like, and it's very orchestrated to where one dog will be doing something and another dog will come in and do something else. And um, I really that- want to do more of that. But, you know, really what this, this uh, you know, the circus school thing, you know, it's given me, uh, a way to orchestrate eight dogs in a ring together. So, you know, that's really the, the, the sort of orchestration I've been doing of late. Um, yeah. And th- those, those early videos were explorations, you know, in that, in that genre. Um, yeah. Have you seen uh, the video I did um, with uh, Schwartz, my little dog, of um, the size discrimination? Maybe I don't know. Tell, tell that me one, that. that one. You know, those are the uh, sort of uh, recent things that I've done, which I've been quite happy with. Um, they're visually they're not so stunning because I'm kind of just filming it myself uh, with my phone and not paying too much protect, uh, uh, attention to the production. But um, if he takes, I take um, four coins. And I lay them out in different ways, and he always brings them back in order of the biggest one first. I, I think I did. Actually, I did. Was that that was um, within a year ago? But it was a little bit yeah. ago. Yeah, it was. A, it was a bit ago. Yeah. No, I did see that. I did see that. I did see that. Yeah, that took some doing. Yeah, that's the kind of stuff. But then you also had that. You also uh, had a chicken, and somebody huh? told me. I think. I can't remember a lot of stuff. I, I, Mike Mike Ellis told me a bunch of stuff. Like when I was watching that DVD, he was with me. Uh-huh. And we were watching it together, and he was. That's the thing. He was giving me a lot of backstory. Okay. He told me about that when you trained the dog for the girl, and you decided to use the sampler. Oh you yeah, know? yeah. You know the funny thing about that is that girl called me 
as an adult. And um, she works at a publishing company. And she says, I've been tasked at finding a dog trainer to write a book. And oh. I remember I was a little girl and you came in and sampled my voice and trained my dog like with this sampler, you know, yes. there's some video of it. It worked really good. And, um, and you know, now she's like, you know, like a, a, an adult with a career in publishing and um, um, they want me to send a, a, a manuscript that was a while ago. So it's not like hot, you know, hot off the, hot news anymore, but it was just, it's just uh, interesting that you brought that video up and that, that woman hunted me down years later. Yeah. Well, it was, that was, abs you know, when I, when he told me that, I thought that is brilliant. You know, I mean, it really, it's, that's what I mean. You have these, there's, you got something going on with your brain that just comes up with these ideas. Cause I don't think anybody would have, I mean, it's a logical thought for sure, but you have to come up with that thought the same way you have to come up with a thought or an approach of how you're going to teach a dog to open a mailbox and put a letter in and shut the mailbox or decide or decipher between. And the whole thing is that sight discrimination, size discrimination is a completely different bag than scent discrimination or these physical things you're teaching the dog. Yeah. That that must that was some work, huh? I'm not going to yeah. ask you how you did it. Well, yeah. wow. Yeah. Um. You know, I'm, it it was a concentrated effort, and I got it done. Um. I think you know, I, I to to show it off again, I'd have to do some, re, you know, training again. Um. Because mm -hmm. it's like it's sort of you know the more complex the concepts that you teach dogs, the more they're sort of on the edge of being able to understand it. Yes. You know, they have like, you could tell they're just struggling with, you know, sort of like humans struggling with the idea of, of outer space and time and, mm -hmm. you know, that sort of thing. Yeah. You know, they're struggling with the, with these concepts. Um, but that, you know, that was, that was really fun um, to try and communicate such a, such a strange thing as size comparison to them. Totally. Because there's no other association they can make other than the size of the coin not a smell right, right. did you right. lay them out in random order too yes i change the order every time oh so yeah. it's not just a it's not a, a, a like a trick and, and when yeah. i say trick i don't mean a trick i mean like you're not just tricking well, no, someone I'm all for, you know fake acts of intelligence you know <laughs> Or, you know, tricking things, uh, gimmicking things. But no, I mean, this is a, that was like just an, oh, an exercise, like scent discrimination. Totally. You know, which is a trick, but it's also at the dogs actually just, you know, finding the scent. Yeah. And I mean, you can do things like grab your leash, grab your bowl, grab your this ball. Uh -huh. We're talking about the same object and, and. That's very interesting. I'm going to have to go back and watch that because I just was, I was, I'm always caught up in that shoe thing, man. <laughs> Sorry, but I just, uh, it's just, that's the one I was going to say when I'm watching, I usually will get together with people and uh, you, sometimes people who I end up hanging out with them after a lesson and I'm like, you want to see some cool training, check this out. And then I, I usually try to find the shoe one by like the third video and then, then they just look at me weird, you know, but I'm like, it's so funny because of, um. It was just so artistic and beautiful because these shoes and the beautiful music, the French music in the back, and then the woman's shoes, and then uh, it ends. You yeah, know? that was, yeah, it was just absolutely. I'm just so glad that, that that reached you. You know, I was doing stuff on that channel that I was, you know, there was like the sort of mingling of that world and, you know, the sort of ring sports stuff mm -hmm. that was also on the channel. And they, they, they kind of belong together, um, but there is a lot of, you know, there's a cross-pollination there that was difficult a little bit. And so I didn't, you know, I didn't get a lot of feedback on sort of those more artistic ones. So I appreciate it. Yeah, yeah. That's, well, I mean, people probably at that time, too, people knew you as, you know, probably a ring guy, I suppose. But you also, I got to ask you this, you also worked at the hearing clinic, though. Yeah, yeah, the hearing dog uh, program. Yeah, what was that like? 
it was it was great. I mean, I got a lot of um, I, I made a lot of a lot of progress in little dog training. Mm. You know, it was three years where all I trained was little dogs. You know, morning, noon, and night terriers, um, poodle mixes, terrier mixes, uh, chihuahuas, and all the little the various little dog, you know, types of little, little dogs like Havanese or whatever. I just trained them constantly for three years and, and, you know, put them in, in people's houses as, as hearing dogs. So I got a lot of experience in, you know, what a working dog can be, um, outside of its uniform. (laughs) Yeah. Uh, we always think, well, that's a working dog. And cause it's a, a do you know, it looks like a Doberman or something. Um, uh, but there's just so many dogs out there that will work for different things that aren't wearing a specific uniform. But if you know how to look for types, um, you can find those those dogs in the shelter, or on the street, or or wherever. Um, so I learned a lot about that. Um, and um, you know, the the whole or or most of the staff were ring sport trainers. So we did a lot of ring sport training techniques without the bite work, obviously, but we, we use the, you know, um, uh, concepts that we had learned in, in ring sport to make the dogs perform faster and better and respond better and stuff like that. Um, and, and that was a lot of fun. And just, and just walking dogs around San Francisco and getting them used to things like getting sketchy dogs used to, uh, hectic environments. Uh, constantly um, was just a real uh, was real interesting challenging yeah yeah it was challenging and you know that that area of San Francisco um, is especially challenging because there's a lot of characters around there Mm. a lot of different street scenes of um, all kinds of crazy stuff happening you know and here we had like little dogs you know, at foot level, trying to make bomb proof. Mm-hmm. So it was a good experience. How long did you keep a dog for before you would, on, on average, before they would go out to to work? Well, you know, the hearing dog program was was different from a lot of programs because we were taking dogs from shelters. Mm. So we'd have to take the dog from the shelter, and it wasn't, you know, it was a lot of times they were high kill shelters. Um, so the dog needed to go into quarantine and be evaluated and oh. get sort of fattened up and, and groomed and, and, you know, all that sort of stuff. And then we started training him. So it, it varied, you know, it really varied. I, I mean, ideally like, you know, four or five months. Um, but dogs came in like, you know, obviously, uh, some of the dogs that we came in, we also worked with uh, guide dogs for the blind, um, taking their their um, labs that didn't pass the guide dogs program, so those dogs could go out a lot quicker than some of the like you know chihuahuas and stuff. Mm-hmm. But uh, the chihuahuas and the terriers and all that stuff, there's sort of a, a, a level of finesse you need to develop, you know, to get them to work good, and I, I enjoyed that. Super difficult. I know when I, when I got into the poodle thing. I mean, I had the little one here, but then when I bought the female and then decided this was going to be my, my side gig or whatever, it was very short lived. But um, I, was, I was some things were very. I mean, they were they're very capable. At least yeah. the the ones I had it was like I, I can even I can even give you an example and you can take this. I had this first one, Bill, and he was uh, brown. He was pretty big, and I ended up. He was too big for what we needed, so I couldn't couldn't keep him. But I was trying to teach him to shut the cupboard because the little guy here that we have, he shuts the cupboard. Okay. Like, I just somehow taught him. I think I was trying to teach him to play the guitar or something. He ended up shutting the yeah. cupboard. So he goes around and shuts all the open cupboards. Okay. This is his job. Still, he's 12. He still does this all day long. So I <clears throat> thought I'd teach the other one. And he was pushing a Pilates ball. And everything I was doing, I was like, well, well I'm trying to think of stuff you would do. Because <laughs> I, mean, I, I just bored. I don't want to do healing, and I don't want to do sit stays and all this kind of stuff. I mean, there were certain things I had to do, go to place, and we were playing tug and a lot of retrieve stuff. But uh, So I went up to do the shut the cupboard, and I was using a clicker. 
for uh -huh. du for duration, uh -huh. and then I give him like an okay or something to release him. Yeah. So he went up and shut the cupboard unexpectedly. I was reaching for something on the shelf, and he went up and he hit it, and mm -hmm. like slid and hit the ground, uh -huh. and looked and looked at me, and I clicked at that moment, uh -huh. which obviously is not the right moment. I clicked when he okay. hit the ground. Right. Okay. Yeah. And he jumped back up on the cupboard and looked at me. Yeah. Yeah. It was an incorrect rep. Yeah. And that was the last time I ever did anything. Every time I walked up with that thing, I said, shut the cupboard. He'd run from, he totally Freedom? would go up and, yeah, one yeah. incorrect rep. Yeah. You think it was an incorrect rep or he just scared himself? You mean when he, when he shut the cupboard? Or what yeah. do you mean? Yeah. When he, when he shut the cupboard. No. Well, he didn't seem to be, he wasn't, he just kind of like the cupboard shut and he uh -huh. slid down and he kind of uh -huh. looked at me. He seemed fine. He just looked at me and then I clicked and I was like, ah, you know, yeah. and, and then he jumped up. The cupboard wasn't open again, but then he jumped up on the cupboard again and looked at me. Uh -huh. But I was doing a lot of that. I was, he was standing on like a pickle jar and he was standing on different things with his front feet. So he was real front feet heavy at that time. Uh -huh. We're doing a lot of things with that. But yeah. I mean, I just, I was very surprised that he looked at me like, and I'm not trying to be uh, like, you know, trying to look at it like lassie or something, something like that. But he yeah. looked right at me and then went up and jumped on the cupboard again uh -huh. and looked at me again. Like, this uh -huh. is it, right? This is what you want. Uh -huh. So, uh, I, I just. Smart dogs, you know, um, it, the, the thing about them, um, I think is, uh, you know, sometimes I've had difficulty with poodles with their food drive. Um, they don't have any. Yeah, some some of them, you know, really hold off with their their food drive compared to other dogs. Yeah. Um, but uh, just the the kind of stuff they can figure out, and I really like a dog that's like watches and thinks about things and tries rather than a really impulsive dog. Mm -hmm. Uh, I, but you know, you need a balance. So, you know, some, that impulsiveness needs to be brought out too, yeah. Yeah. you know, and, and it, at circus school, we always start with like classical conditioning stuff to build up their confidence and kind of build their drive, you know, build their, their, you know, positive emotional experience of the environment, mm -hmm. um, you know, and build character. And yeah, that's something that, you know, I've taken from ring sport, like start by building some character mm -hmm. in the dog, um, before we start refining, mm -hmm. you know? So definitely, I mean, you need to keep that balance. If, if the dog has too much character, you need to start refining much more quickly, but you have to, you know, keep, keep an eye on, on things, you know, cause overthinking and, and like using the clicker for everything can be, um, you know, can cause him to overthink and they'll overthink he's not good for the confidence. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I usually, I use it for something. I usually use it for duration type things and sometimes for chaining things behave, uh, together, but some dogs, it just doesn't work. It just mm -hmm. doesn't work well. They just don't respond. They, either they're way overstimulated, mm -hmm. you know, they just get too overstimulated and they stop thinking, mm -hmm. you know, but, um, this dog I have now, you know what I did with him is, um, I want to, this was again inspired by your sampler. So this, this is how much your stuff has stuck with me. So that was, I never even saw that. Mike, Mike told me about that back in 2005. Well, it's on there. It's on there. You can see it. You know? It is. It's on the, it is. See, I never yeah. saw that. You yeah. Just told me. It's just a picture of a German shepherd <laughs> sitting and downing to a sampled voice. Oh my God. Yeah. Well, I thought um, I should, I want to see if I can get, I got this puppy, this Dutch yeah. shepherd puppy now. He's like almost two, and I don't know what I'm going to do with him, but I'm just horsing around with him. And I thought, well, I'll, let me see if I can get him to sit and down from different notes on the piano. Ah. Right? Yeah. And it was kind of working, but it wasn't because I suck at the piano, and I have to look for the note. Uh -huh. You know what I mean? So the timing was never right. Yeah. And, and, and then, of course, you have to. So I was actually having coffee with my high school theater teacher. Uh -huh. We were both at this music store. We're like, hey, let's go grab a coffee while my guitar was getting fixed. She, I told her about it. She said, why don't you use a pitch pipe? Uh huh. And I said, that's really smart. So I sure. went back to the music store, got my guitar, grabbed the pitch pipe, went home, went to work. And within about three days, I had him 
releasing on an A. Nice. He would he would sit on a C. Uh huh. He would down on a G. Uh huh. And if I hit an A sharp, he wouldn't do anything. Uh huh. Half That's a step. Cool. That's yeah, cool. and so it was pretty. And I'm like, what am I gonna do with this? So I would two to C. He'd sit. Mm-hmm. I'd go give him a piece of food. I'd back up three steps. I'd two to C again. And I'd go give him another piece of food, like saying, good sit. Mm-hmm. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. And then I would toot an A, and he'd pop up. I got a video of it. He was about uh-huh. four months old. Yeah. But it just really, uh, even though I kind of probably somewhere in my mind knew that they were capable of this type of uh, sure. articulation. Yeah. I just It's the same sound. Do you see what I mean? It's uh-huh. not like an it, ooh and an ah sound. It's just the same yeah, sound. But yeah, I, yeah. yeah, it was just. But I, that's yeah. great. I mean, I think you should. I think you should stop doing it now. Yeah, you've planted a seed. I think you should just let your mind, you know, sort of go wide and fu- think of some sort of uh, conceptual structure for the trick. Yeah. Um, and you know, it could be different lyrics. Uh, or something like that, um, and and you could you know then you could work it into a trick you know where the one chord or one note would would mean a certain action, you know. I'm big into planting seeds. Yeah, that's I actually, see. I never and thought about before. I go too deep. I just go back and think about it for a good long time and just you know you know, what kind of conceptual structure can I put under it to make it into a trick? Um, you know, how can you flush it out with, you know, where's the, where is the trick in there? So you could do just a demonstration type, type trick where you say, okay, I trained my dog to respond to different tones and here's a 440 and, you know, and here's whatever C is, and da da da, and and sort of just do it as like a science fair demo, mm-hmm. or you could do it more of like a, you know, a dramatic thing. I don't know exactly offhand what it could be, but um, those notes are going to signal him to do something within a greater piece. You know, just totally. what is. That? What is that? And you might think about that for years. And, you know, one day you'll be, you know, on a bike ride and you'll see, you know, a squirrel running down the wire or something and you'll go, aha, (laughs) I know what I could do. Mm. You know, Mm -hmm. Uh, it's interesting, though, because you're chairs. I, you know, I just, you know, I don't know. It's cool. It's cool because you're right away saying don't lock into a structure right away. Don't lock into an idea. Yeah, right. Because that's where yeah, that's where it can all go wrong, honestly. Well, that's and cool. and also with your with your training, then you'll be like, you know, five hundred reps into something that you want to change the other way. Yeah. You know, so I mean, you know, you can do it. You know, that the dog can do it. But what is the it now? Yeah, totally. You know. Well, that's pretty much, you know, I haven't done it in a while, but that's what I was thinking. I'm like, so now what? Here's here's something. My dog can detect a wrong note. Okay, so play a piece in another key, and when you hit, you know, C, um, I don't know, in, in the key of A or something, I don't, I don't know what, it, you know, you have to find something around the wrong notes that will, you know, will be in like a typical, like a song that everyone would sort of know that note is wrong. Um, and the dog will then, you know, hit a button that says incorrect note. Oh, that know. would be righteous. <laughs> <laughs> that could totally be done, though. Oh, that could totally be done because you could also help them with some body language where you stop at the wrong note and, and, and you could isolate the wrong note with your pitch pipe or whatever, you know. And you can, you know, habituate them to all the right notes so they don't, you know, they do something else or they don't do what, you know, they, they don't respond to those notes just like you did with your A flat or whatever. Yes. I'm just <laughs> thinking about how that would be so cool. Oh, my God. Music lessons, you know. 
Um, you know, it could just be a do re mi, and then you go, you know, sharp or flat on on something, uh, and they press a button. Yeah. Maybe they can you like um, like America's Got Talent. Yeah. Sure. You know what I mean? Like, yeah, totally. Um, totally. You know, like whatever you train them to uh, respond to flat notes, and then you you play something in a sharp key, and you play something obviously flat and that's the wrong note and they press a button that lights up. And that's even easier because it's just one button. You yeah, know? it's just one button. It's, they have, to, they have yeah. to recognize the signal and push the button. Yeah. That's essentially it. Yeah, you, yeah could, well, you could go, um, you could go uh, train them then. And like another level of deception could be something like, uh, they they then tell you the right note. So you t you train them to respond to a note. Let's say it's the flatted of something that's supposed to be sharp or something, and and they tell you it's the wrong note, and then immediately after tell you what's the right note to press or to play. How would um, they do that? How how are you thinking they would do that? They would do it by, you know, we, we, you'd have to keep it super easy for them. Mm -hmm. Like, if you have enough layers of complexity, like this, an, uh, an easy layer might escape someone. Mm -hmm. So you know how you asked me whether I was doing the, um, the, 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 uh, the size discrimination, like, in a row? Mm -hmm. Which, of course, I did at first, and then I changed the rows around and whatnot and mixed it up slowly, right? But... Um, uh, well, you could put the right note on the keyboard as the as you know the first note uh, closest to the dog, sort of thing. Sure. You know, some sort of like glue a like a, a cork to it, you know, like a cork from a wine bottle. Yeah. So it's up, you know. So they go, they would go along a keyboard and press the first raised note that they see with their nose. Is all of this just coming to you right now? Yeah, it's just coming to me. Yeah. <laughs> you know, so you know, you have your little keyboard, and then it's you hilarious. have whatever three wrong, you know, three, the three notes that you're supposed to play, and the you know the you play the wrong note. The dog alerts you by you know pressing a button that makes a red light go on or or whatever, and then you say, well, really, what's the right note? What right note should I play? And then you maybe start going again, playing again, and the dog goes and pokes that right note on the keyboard, which is yeah. just the first note. So it's not like they're actually selecting out that note. Yeah. It's just another layer of the trick where people will kind of forget about trying to figure out how the whole thing works. Yeah, for sure. Um, because you you have a, a, you know, another layer of subterfuge before it. <laughs> That's crazy. I see. I didn't go anywhere. I didn't think of anything like that at all. But it's totally possible, especially if you you could even do it in a pattern sense. Yeah. And it would be super, super easy that way. Yeah. Well, not super easy. I shouldn't say that, but it would be, it would be, you know. Let me let me ask you this though. I wanted to ask you this before I forget. You said the guy was training with seals. Yeah. When you were a kid. With when a was, seal that he found orphaned. Yeah. So it wasn't like a. A master seal trainer who's just a lobsterman who yeah. found an open seal and started, you know, kept it and started training it. Okay. So he was a, because I talked to a guy who trained dolphins and seals once. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. And I asked him which one was more difficult. And he said uh -huh. seals uh -huh. because deprivation is the only thing they have uh -huh. you know, with these guys. And so with the dolphins, if they aren't cooperating, they just walk away and they come back in 20 minutes or something like that. But he said the seals would just get out of the pool and follow you. Ah. You know, which I thought was pretty Oh, that's, that's funny because they, they come out, right? Yeah, yeah, I know. So he said they were they were pretty tricky to train. So Yeah, well, um, definitely, you know, when you see trained seals are usually sea lions. Um, yeah. A harbor seal is smaller? Is that the deal? Yeah, I mean, it's like a big, fat thing. You know, they're not very athletic. <laughs> It's like it looks kind of like a pug swimming around. <laughs> really? Okay. Yeah, yeah. But Don't... I mean, 
that was part of he he worked that into Andre's shtick where he would jump through shrinking hoops and eventually kind of get stuck in the center of one hoop, you know. And you know he, he makes some joke about how Andre has to lose weight or yeah, so, sure. you know, less less fish or something like that. I mean, sometimes those simple a simple trick will get more of a response from the audience than some. Oh my God! Look what I trained my dog to do. You know. Sure, something super elaborate. Yeah. 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 Wow. That is fascinating. How about the chicken? What did you think about working with the chicken when you had the chicken? Do you still have the chicken? No, I don't. And the funny thing is, I just got called today for a a a video shoot with a chicken, um, <laughs> based on a, um, a Slim Jim commercial that I did with a chicken a long, long time ago. I did a Slim Jim commercial featuring um, professional wrestlers and all this stuff. And the chicken, you know, was just standing there pecking. Oh, I think it was it was like pecking at some steak. It was like the new flavor, chicken and steak. <laughs> <laughs> you know. And anyway, so that but hey, I got a call uh, today, and and no, I don't have chickens. But you know, it's the same thing. With you know, the the thing about the chicken is people think that they're stupid. And it's the best thing because they're 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 actually smart in, in a lot of ways visually. They're they're very smart, you know. They can like look in your rug and you know pick out the quinoa, you know, and the couscous, you know. They can see you know down to very small levels of detail. Like oh, I like that seed more. That one looks more nutritious or whatever. I'll get that one first, you know. So they're detail oriented in their sort of visual search behavior. So, um, you know, they're, they're good and easy to train that way. You also trained a fish to swim through a hoop. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. That was, that was fun too. I mean, um, you know, that's, that's the thing. I mean, once you start training animals, you see, you realize how, how smart they are, you know, Mm -hmm. Everything you think about, oh, you know, fish are stupid. You're like, no, they're more like birds than you think. You are know? they really? Are they? Yeah. 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 Not all of them, not every single one of them, but sure. you know, there's a lot of fish with a, you know, very, they're very conscious. Mm -hmm. I talked to a guy last week. I, th I think I'm going to get a African pied crow. Oh, nice. See one of those? I think so. I just, I really got to think about it. I really got to think some more. Don't you need to have um, a permit? Not for one of those, because it's it's a it's a not a native species. So, right, that, but, even, but but so maybe that are you, are you are you in Wisconsin? Yeah, yeah. So I think in Wisconsin it might be different than California, right? Uh, because you know people are worried about them getting getting loose and establishing, being becoming a pest or whatever. Yeah, I I don't I don't think so. Not that I know of. I know that if I, I know I can't have a native one. I looked into that. Uh -huh. Yeah. Kind of under any circumstances, but actually a friend of mine, a guy that I know through the dogs, he just got one. So oh, I would nice. assume it's okay and he's up north a little yeah. bit. But I talked to this guy, he's been he's been training him. He did all the crows in Walking Dead. And uh, he nice. did um It's very interesting. He breeds these African pied crows and African white-billed ravens. Oh, nice. Yeah, dude. But so I said, I really want to, I told him, I, you know, I, I've, I have crows here close uh -huh. to my place and I've been feeding them for about five, six years. Yeah. And, and they hate me. They don't want anything uh -huh. to do with me at all. So, yeah. but I've always wanted one and I thought, I called this guy and I said, I really want a raven, you uh -huh. know, because they're huge and yeah. they're, they're actually more intelligent according to him. Right. Uh -huh. And he's like, well, they get a little quirky. And I said, what do you mean? And he said... Well, you know, they might like dive bomb a kid. <laughs> uh, <laughs> so yeah, the way yeah. he describes it, they're malamwish. Uh -huh. you know? Like they're just super intense. And once they get to be mature, they get punky. But I asked him how he trains them. I'm like, do you use a clicker or, you know, he said pressure. Oh, really? Yeah, man. All right. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, he said, he said, these guys are tough. They're real strong. And uh -huh. you know what? Now they're used, they're rewarding them and stuff. They're rewarding yeah. them, but they're but initially they have to establish this 
ranking system because apparently they're super social uh-huh. and they get the ranking thing quite mm-hmm. a bit. He told me he had a male that was a hybrid that he trained for three years and he wouldn't breed uh-huh. because he was so into him. Uh-huh. You know what I mean? He kept him for a breeding program. So uh-huh. yeah, it's pretty interesting. So, and, yeah. and, and they are, I mean, I know the ones here, I hide stuff for them and it's, it's, the, uh-huh. it's quick as they find it. It's just crazy. So really, but yeah, I, th- I guess, you know, I've only, I've done a, a, just dogs is all I've really had the opportunity uh-huh. to, to dive into. Yeah. Um, but I suppose, you know, aside from predator and, and prey, right? Yeah. They're the same, right? I mean, all animals kind of function in a similar. Yeah, I mean, I think you have to learn the nuance of, of you know, the animals that you're working with. I mean, think about all the stuff we know about, you know, when a dog looks at you funny, you know, you instantly know, ooh, I better not push my luck here or something like that, where someone else might not know that and act a fool, you know, um, I better stand up and get away from this dog. You know what I mean? Like, yeah, you know, totally. In those situations where they suddenly, you know, you push the wrong button and you caught it before the dog actually got you. And, um, and you know, you have to learn the nuances of, of different animals, just like studying them in the wild. It's great. It's a great way. Mm-hmm. you know, to learn about them for sure, you know, and also listening to other people's theories, you know, I mean, the, the old saying, the only thing two trainers can agree on is what the third one's doing wrong. <laughs> yeah, yeah, totally. Yeah. So you got to do your homework and, and, uh, but I think that would be a great experience. You should definitely do it. Yeah. It's just such a huge commitment. Yeah. 25 to 50 years. Oh, I know. You know, I got, the thing is we got the, I talked to the guy. We got the kennel, and I would I would just convert one of our kennels into because he says they should live outside all the time because of mm-hmm. whatever. So, yeah, it's I just want it for the training, yeah. you know, just to. Ex, ex, I mean, they're supposed to be as smart as like a seven year old, apparently. Yeah. So I just thought, boy, this would be, and I like them. I just have some yeah. kind of attraction to them, you know. Yeah, so. they're very cool. I know. Yeah. Wonder so, how those those uh, crows you've been feeding, you know, will, will respond to one. It might be like the painted bird. Yeah. Well, <laughs> oh. he told me when they escape, they can get killed because they'll see him with that thing and they'll, yeah. Cause they do free fly them. It's really interesting, yeah. man. Yeah. They, they, did you ever do birds? Did you ever do any no. kind of, no. I didn't need, I don't, I don't know it's anything just, about it. I've, I've, I've learned about them and, you know, ask my share of questions and stuff, but not, um, I don't have a lot of experience with free flight. Yeah. Well, the, the videos I saw, they put like a harness on them uh-huh. with really thin little bungees. Right. And attach it to a runner. Uh huh. And they just fly them back and forth on this runner apparently. But yeah. he, he said, he told me about a guy that I thought this was pretty interesting. He told me about a guy that lives somewhere out here that does big game recovery for these hunters uh-huh. and he's got dogs uh-huh yeah right blood tracking and stuff yep yeah and, and he got a crow uh-huh from this guy no way <laughs> yeah, dude. so it's like a drone yeah yeah so he told me he i can't find the video i'm going to talk to him uh, again uh-huh. next week he told me the guy put the crow up at night and taught him to return to a flashlight it was in a big open clearing and everything was safe. And he said at one point when they were out working, it got dark and somehow the crow came back and he was signaling something with the flashlight and he made the association. And just to shoot this video, he put him up at night and had him not for long and had him come back down to the flashlight. Oh, wow. Crazy, wow. huh? Cause they don't, you know, they don't fly at night. Yeah. 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 Uh, huh. Well, owls can, you know, be trained to hunt in the day, I suppose, you know, you could train some birds to, they like those crepuscular hours where it's dawn and dusk, so mm-hmm. I suppose you can kind of play with that. Yeah, extend it or start yeah. it early or something, yeah. It's but, all so interesting was, did stuff. You, did you say he was doing blood tracking with the crow, or did he just bring it with him? No, no, the crow was finding, the, the dogs would go and the crow would fly up overhead like a drone. Oh wow! And would find the, uh, find the, uh, find the kill, and then signal somehow, 
like whether he's so, calling or whatever. It was it was basically so like basically, his own. Uh, he uh, had trained dogs, and and the, and the bird was socialized to the dogs. The bird probably just followed with the dogs, and then kind of figured out what was going on. Yep, some something out of it. You know, it'd because, be real dangerous. I mean, I, I mean, uh, having you know exhibitors and stuff around with the with a naive bird mm -hmm. you know cooper's hawk or goss hawk comes mm -hmm. by boom mm -hmm. uh, you know yeah game over yeah <clears throat> yeah it's, so it's well, I, i'm into um gliders you know so that's that's kind of besides music I, i'm into these uh gliders sailplanes well i i was the next question i was actually going to ask you is i've seen you but you were before you were doing rc planes a little bit too right with yeah. a with a motor yeah first i got the the motor thing going um and learned how to fly and then from there i started doing the sailplanes without the motor mm -hmm. based on like slope lift and thermals and stuff like that how do you get them up how do you get them up in the air uh climb a hill and face them into the wind. It's got to be the right wind. Um, and the wind is pushed up a slope. And so there's like um, a standing wave in front of the hill of, of just this big bump of air. Mm -hmm. And it makes like a band. And you keep them in and around that band of lift. And from there, by sort of throwing their weight around, making them sort of, so they catch more wind or shed more wind. You can kind of build up speed and, you know, they just keep going. They'll, they'll basically, you know, keep on going as long as the winds are right. It's like an albatross. Yeah, exactly. Like an albatross does the same thing. They wow. do uh, dynamic soar. Well, they do slope yeah. soar too. All of them, all of them do it. Uh, they, they do, uh, you know, specifically the albatross does dynamic soaring, which is, Gliders can do that too. In fact, the can they? The, yeah, the 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 speed, the the, the fastest um, flying remote control vehicle or whatever is a uh, is a uh, is a dynamic soaring non powered glider. I think it got up to like seven hundred and something miles an hour. What? Yeah, yeah. seven hundred miles an hour doing that dynamic soaring with like yeah. a. Yeah, they're all, you know, they're all... It's like a roller know, coaster, up, though. Um, with, you know, fiberglass, because they can, they can kind of blow up in the air if they're not built strong. Sure. But it's like a roller coaster, I bet, when you get that whip going on, you know? Yeah, you can't even see it. You know, you can... The It's like it goes into the Matrix, where, you know, you saw it here, and then next thing you know, it's, you know, down, you know, downfield away from you. Yeah, so the people that do it have really good... Uh, reflexes sure i don't do that but you know i i like it's a lot like dog training or music you know it's like this sense of um sort of reading the conditions you know reading the sky um sort of wagering a bet i wonder if i do this will this will happen and observing behavior sort of being in a feedback loop um and timing you know this timing coordination and focus and stuff like that so it's you know for someone that that likes to train gliders i mean or or any sort of sort of rc plane but especially i think the sailplanes are are, are you know are an instant i was instantly hooked really yeah. did you so you just this is a new endeavor for you this is pretty new yeah, totally new. did you crash a bunch when you started Oh my God. Yeah. Really? I really did. You know, you have to learn how to do it. Um, but there's, there's flight simulators, so it's easy to learn. You know, you can get, get stuff on your phone and, and, um, the, you can get gliders for relatively cheap, so it's not a big investment. Um, but luckily I have this place where everyone goes and flies. So I, I bumped into just a lot of good, like, you know, sportsman type that, uh, that you know showed me the ropes and stuff and got me started and um like just earlier today i was i went climbed up this peak um and you know flew a glider for about an hour thermaled it way up high got so high it was like just a speck in the sky 
and, you know, brought it down, did all kinds of sort of aerobatic stuff with it and landed it and, and <laughs> walked home. It was really sweet. You so, land. So how did, is it hard to land? It's got to be hard to land them, huh? No, I, I, they're pretty, well, everything's a little hard. You know, it's definitely a skill you got to learn. It's not like a, just a toy where you go out and have fun the first time. You have to develop all these sort of skills. Like the biggest skill with landing is, you know, when they go away from you, you know, left is left, right is right. But when they come back towards you, right is left and left is right. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Oh. So, yeah, so you have to, um, you know, even if you're in a panic situation, sort of reverse in your in your mind, it just becomes second nature, mm -hmm. you know. In fact, I just think of it as sort of like here's here's the wings of the plane. There's a little stick that controls the wings going up and down like this. If the the wing drops like this as the plane's coming towards me, I just put the stick under there, and it evens it out. Oh. And so it's just like a little mental gymnastics that you get used to. Um, and that's the hardest part about landing. But, I mean, you're really – it's a behavior-driven thing. And that's what is the most uh, interesting thing to, for me is watching the airframe uh, behave in the wind and in the different conditions and sort of reading, you know, the atmosphere based on, you know, is there lift there? Is, you know, the air – is there an updraft or a downdraft or, you know, how, how are the conditions affecting the plane and then – you know, kind of carving it through those conditions is like for a trainer, it's like, oh, this is great. Uh, I don't have to worry about its well being at all. You yes, know, yes. You know, it's that completely out of it. And all I see is just, just behavior, you know? So it's interesting. But you are still dealing with the environment because you're dealing with, you know, um, you know, thermal activity and slope lift and weather patterns and stuff like that and it's just fun to go hiking and do it just like the, the combination of the two is really great how how big is this thing this glider you uh, have well i have a bunch of them oh you can see one of the wings up there sticking up um you can see one of them behind me that pink and green thing mm. um so i have you know everywhere from like two and a half meters to um smaller ones but the ones i go hiking with are, are smaller okay yeah, two and a half meters that's huge yeah, yeah. wingspan yeah wingspan over two and a half meters uh two wow. six yeah so uh but great visibility you know and it's just you know, it's really fun to watch a big bird i fly that one down by the marina where um you know off you know in, in, over the bay and, um, you know, it's, it's really nice to have something really visible. Um, so the three meters or the two and a half meters, once you put it up in the sky, it seems small again. <laughs> wow. Yeah. Yeah. You should check it out, man. It's fun. And I think if you were going to learn how to do free flight with birds, like having that knowledge of, of flight, yeah. um, would be really valuable. Yeah. I, uh, my friend actually growing up, I went with him. He was in some club, uh -huh. and, and yeah. he he flew in a glider, uh -huh. and I went with him. And you know, the plane took it up, and he and I watched oh, him. Nice. Yeah, 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 yeah. It was pretty cool. And my dad was a pilot, actually, really, and had yeah. a plane. Not a, he's like a you know hobby pilot, right? Not a right. pilot pilot, but he had a plane. Yeah. And man, I hate flying. Uh, yeah, <laughs> but this seems like it seems it was like cool it, and meditative from the ground. Yeah. From the this ground, thrilling, you know. Um, because you're, you're projecting yourself up into the plane. Mm -hmm. So even though you're not going to get hurt, if it crashes, um, you still have sort of the, the rush of, you know, feeling like, Oh my God, like I could crash, you know, or if, you know, things are getting out of control. So it's good. You practice keeping your calm yeah. your cool as, you know, things are getting sketched out and everything might go wrong and you just, you know, kind of stay stay with it and try and bring it to the ground or you know get yourself out of a bad sitch situation so if one were going to start doing this would it be smarter for that person to start to start with a regular rc plane or would it be smarter for them to to to, to go not being like real experienced yeah. i don't 
know which is best, but if you have a place um, where you have a hill with wind, um, if you know of a place like that, I would just start with a glider. I mean, um, you just have to do a little like YouTube, you know, research kind of stuff. And um, if, especially if you like going out to the outdoors and stuff, it's more like an outdoor sport. You know, you see a lot of birds and, and, and critters and stuff like that. Birds come down and attack your glider. And yeah. really? Yeah, it's, it's so cool. Like hawks so get all territorial and grab onto it and stuff. And, and uh, wow. yeah, so if you have a place to go hiking with hills and wind, um, I would go to the Dream Flight website and, and buy um, their plane called the Alula. Okay, let me write it down. It looks like a Dream Flight Alula? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. What does it look like? Be stuff you should probably call your friend that knows about uh, models and stuff like that. I mean, could, there, there'll be stuff that you need to figure out how to set it up to put the, you know, the servos in it and that sort of thing. It's all pretty straightforward and widely available as sort of YouTube tutorials and stuff. Okay. But um, it's... It's a really good time, man. You, you, you throw those things up there. You can do it on like a flat field and look for thermals, which is great if you can find them. And, you know, it's like there you found an invisible staircase in the sky. And you're like, the plane just climbed up, you know, hundreds of feet with no power. It's like magic. Um, but, um, yeah, the slope... Working on the slope is like probably the best way to start. I think you have wind just coming one direction. You put the glider out into it, and just practice this kind of keeping hovering it there, um, and then from there you, you learn to kind of handle it like a sailboat almost, how to tack it back and forth. And you know, it's a lot of fun. Check it out. I will. I will. I'm for sure. Gonna, I'm going to talk to my dad about it too because when, when I was a kid, he had an RC plane and he flew that thing quite a bit. He loved that thing. It's a great thing to do with, with, with your dad. I, when my dad comes in and visits, we play fiddle together and we go fly gliders. <laughs> wow, that's so cool. That's so cool. Well, look, man, thank you for everything. Can we do this again? Can we do this sure. again? Yeah. That's great because, you know, we. I'd like to just Next time we talk, I want to know what's, instead of what's been, I want to know what is, you know, oh, yeah. what's yeah. exciting that so, is to come. Uh-huh. Yeah. Kind of like the glider thing and the fiddle thing, but get more into that. And, yeah. You know. So, uh, you're, if people want to find you on Instagram, it's canine lower, lower how do you say that? Lower score? Low, what do they call that? Yeah. yeah lower score. Yeah. Canine underscore, maybe? Un- underscore. Called? Underscore. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Uh, canine underscore circus underscore school like canine circus school with underscores in between um yeah and, and probably instagram is the thing that we're most active on all that stuff also goes to our facebook page um and you know i've been a little lame on on um youtube for like years and years now but i'm thinking about getting back into it and uh, i think you've inspired me maybe to do a podcast you should yeah you should. I mean, you have so many interesting things to talk about. And, and you know, on top of it, you're just a cool cat, man. <laughs> you know? It, yeah, yeah. It's, it's, it's tons of fun. I, I do. I wish because I, I, there is no... I've heard a couple of animal training podcasts. When uh-huh. I decided I wanted to do this thing, I was like, well, you know, I'll talk about something that's, you know, for people here that or whatever. But then, like, find these cool guys. And I'm like, okay. So I want to talk to you. I want to talk to Mike. I want to talk to Dave Croyer. And then nice. from there, I'm like, okay, let's figure it out. Then I don't know what I'm going to do. So, I'm gonna, so uh, you know, I, I got to figure out what I'm going to do. But I wish more people would do it and talk about stuff because there's not a lot of good information from just normal guys just talking. Uh-huh. You know, there's yeah. there's a lot there's a lot of product out there. Uh huh. You know, but there's just not a lot of straight information. You know, so okay. yeah, I think that'd be great if you could. And and I mean, I would be your not probably not your first, but I'll be one of your first many subscribers. Oh, right. Yeah. Like so more stuff like that. 
get yeah. going on my my social media presence again. I've taken a break. Yeah. Well, it's really, you know, I, I do want to say, how do I say this without, sometimes I see Instagram stuff and I'm like, you know, and you know how it got, I don't hardly go on Facebook anymore because of all yeah. that stuff. But every time I see your stuff, it's cool, man. Every mm -hmm. single time, you know, a lot of circus school stuff, but then I see the planes and then sometimes you're playing music and, yeah, yeah. but, um, and I will say this, like in those circus school things, I got to say, man, it looks really joyous. Everybody yeah. looks like they're having a great time. All the people look extremely proud. Uh -huh. you know? uh -huh. And just really, yeah, and that it just seems like a really harmonious, good environment, you know, for people to be in. So Yeah, man, I'm really glad uh, to hear that. And, you know, that makes, it gives me a lot of, you know, faith in in the process that we've laid, laid forward for these people. And, um, you know, it's just great because, you know, you come from the ring sport thing too. And a lot of that stuff about developing character, uh, before, before we do a lot of complex training is coming from that is, I think is some of the best stuff to come out of, uh, ring sport, you know, is, is understanding confidence, understanding aggression too, of course. Um, and, and, you know, it's great that you're picking up on it because that's what's making those sort of happy faces. It's developing the, it's the character developing that we do. Mm -hmm. You're creating, I, I, sometimes it comes off the wrong way, but I like to say, uh, create a monster. Yeah, you, want right. a mon you want a monster, you know? Yeah. Well, we I, do that, you know, um, a lot of that sort of, um, stuff that in the pet dog world is considered taboo. You know, we introduce to people like jumping up. Mm -hmm. you know of course that's oh, I mean that's the, that's the one thing that I don't care if you're like you know a Croatian shepherd person uh, in the mountains or or you know a, a Schutzen guy or you know a search and rescue person you'll always see a picture of them with the dog jumping up on them yes you know it's it's about like a bond you know strengthening that bond so you know that when you push that bond strong it's hard you know push it to its limits you still have that trust mm -hmm. the dogs really i mean i've never had a dog i've never had a dog who didn't just cherish being able to jump up and have that moment with you yeah you know? yeah 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 it's, I mean, yeah, it's, it's a trick that they invented and yeah. and you know it's it's it definitely um it's something that we always get in in circus school we people both kind of like look at us with like wide eyes like I thought this was the most taboo thing in the world. Mm -hmm. I always explain to them, you can train them to jump up. You can train them to get up, get off. Mm -hmm. You can train them to sit. You can train them to down. You can train them to stay. You can train them to come. We're always training in opposites. Mm -hmm. you know, just like when you start training, anything you start training, the dog is going to be a little confused because it's new. They're always going to do the things that they've done most recently or most often. Yeah. You know, they're going to do those things. Um, you're gonna you're gonna see a confused dog trying to do other things. That's that's usually how training begins, mm -hmm. uh, and they get less confused <laughs> the more you you know reward the right moment and all that kind of stuff. Yeah. So, wow. You know. Time. Yeah, it's a journey. Training's definitely a journey, and it's, it's definitely been fun uh, talking to you. Yeah, man, great. I'm glad you had a good time. I certainly did too. It was really great to get to know you. We've only actually talked for about 15 minutes 13 years ago. <laughs> <laughs> and it's just as soon as you, as soon as, you know, first thing is you, you got this whole thing right. I've tried this a couple of times with many people testing and stuff, Absolutely. and nobody can get this thing figured out. You got it right, right away. And then I said, can you talk a little bit? And you said, testing, one, two, testing, <laughs> testing. And I'm like, <laughs> we're just, we're from the, we're, we're, there's a certain part of us that are just from the same school, man. Yeah, you know, absolutely. music. Well, stuff, I love so. the fact that you grew up in this sort of like music store, music school environment. I always, that's one of the things that um, a magical world that we lost, you know, is, is you know, music, music stores are dying off, you know, and, you know, just people who aren't stars, you know, just playing music for, you know, for the, for the, just for the pride of, you know, like domestic pride, you know, mm -hmm. hey, yeah. Uh, you know, come on to my porch and let's let's jam kind of thing, you know. 
You know, we don't have, you know, everything is so fame driven and star driven. And, you know, um, we're, we're trying to bring it back at circus school. We're trying to bring it back to that sort of like folk school level where we're just training people to enjoy what their dog can do and sort of realize their, their dog's full potential of not just a top down type approach where, you know, follow every word I say, but what can you do? You know, what's the, you know, what are all the, the behaviors that, that I can explore teaching you and really learning how to teach. Um, so, you know, that I think that music school world, like you said, like, you know, finding, um, you know, the, the written music and going through all that stuff and, and, um, that wood, that process of wood shedding, yeah. you know, I love that. You either love it or you don't love it. You know, I love it. Um, I like doing it non-academically. I kind of, that's how I like to do training too. I feel things out, mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, um, and, and, you know, so that's really cool just to hear about your background and, and, and your father with the music school and starting you guys young like that. Yeah, we, yeah. yeah, it was, I, I think in high, you know, when I was a kid, I didn't appreciate it as much as I do now, but, um, it did, it really, you know, it's, I think everybody should do something like that because it really teaches you, I think people should dive into their own creativity and sometimes it's so hard for all of us to be creative because we're all so insecure. Like you said in the beginning, you got to be willing to like put that stuff out there. Yeah. You know, and it's, I think a lot of people have a problem with, with that, but it's just what you're doing. I guess I didn't know this part about you, but what you are doing is you're like, you, you really are bettering the situation for all these people. You're creating confidence in the people, confidence in the dogs. You're building monsters on both ends. Oh, and, yeah. Uh, Absolutely. You know, and also you're teaching people the same thing, touch and feel and all this stuff, which is difficult. And you're taking the time and you're doing it. But you've also, sounds like, have a strategy to it rather than like, oh, this is going wrong. Let me show you how to do this right. Instead of like, I'm sure you encounter things like that here and there or whatever. But uh, if you have a strategy to teaching this touch and feel, it's just such a God, it's good for you, man. All around, you know. Um, my my strategy is, you know, I show them, they try it. I look for learning opportunities, you know, to to highlight for them. But I let them come, and I try not to force it down their throats. Mm -hmm. um, so, um, you know, that's that's been. It's really a learning by doing. Thing, and that's why we haven't tried to expand our market too much more because we live, you know, we're here in the Bay Area. A lot of people come to this area from other places. A lot, you know, we have we have local clientele that that keep us busy, and they actually come and they learn here rather than sort of bundling it into a package to sell on the internet or something like that. You know, so um, one of the things about that has allowed me to really hone in on, you know, staying focused on what I'm doing and not worrying about what other people are doing. Yeah. Um, and, you know, seeing what works and not getting scattered and sort of stay on message that way. Mm -hmm. um, so, yeah, I, I encourage everyone out there in dog trainer land to, you know, really, you know, be local, you know, forget about, you know, trying to get this national audience Make your local area great before you go any bigger. Yeah, you know? for sure. If you can have the thing is, I think if you have a local base, a local clientele that continues to grow. Yeah, you're doing it right. Yeah, that's that's the real because, you know, all the smoke and mirrors. It's just smoke and mirrors and it all blows up at some point. And now we're living. See, you're from before that world. I, when I got into this stuff, that world was just starting to right. exist. So y you know, you know from before that world because you're already training and stuff then. But it's a, it's hard. But if you just, you know, the, the word of mouth, grassroots kind of stuff is always the best. It's always yeah. the best. And, just do uh, the, you know, the best job you can. And my final word for the dog trainers out there is always train the dog that's in front of you, not the dog that you had. Uh, five minutes ago, or the dog that you think you have, or the dog you want to have, but 
train the dog that you have right there in the moment and always do the right thing for the dog and um, no one can ever fault you for that. Forget about what you know. anyone in the peanut gallery might say. Do the right thing for the moment and people who understand dog training will go, aha, well, they're doing this and that's the right thing to do. Mm -hmm. So those are my final words. Bless you, man. <laughs> Bless you. You're a treasure. Please, yeah, come back. We'll talk again and, and I, I'd love to see more of your stuff online, okay? We all would. Everybody make sure to go Master of Hounds on YouTube. That channel's still up, right? Yep, Master of Hounds. Yeah, go to that. There's a lot of uh, just great stuff there. And then canine uh, underscore circus underscore school on Instagram. That's where you're the most active right now. Find them on Facebook too. So, yeah, check it out, you guys. Binge on Francis Metcalf. It's definitely a good weekend evening thing to do. So, all right, man. Thank you again, Francis. Take, Take care. We'll talk soon.